Today I'm taking you through my experience of painting this master copy of Elizabeth Louise Vigie Lebrun's Madame Grande. Plus, I'll be explaining everything I've learned from this master copy. First, I like to start with a little color and value exploration of my reference image. I found my reference image at the Art Renewal Center's museum, and then I cropped it to this 12 by 12 square shape, and then added a simple grid. I'm going to be painting this master copy with a selective start method, therefore I needed to mix my palette first. Here's a look at the oil paints that I've used. And as usual, I've arranged my palette with my lights at the bottom, my mid-tones in the middle, and my darks at the top. So here's a look at the finished initial palette. I'm sure there'll be some variations of these shades created as I paint along. With Selective Start, I need to choose a feature on the face that I want to start my portrait painting with. So I have selected the left eye, so I'm using the softly drawn grid to help kind of figure out where that eye needs to start on the canvas. As you're watching this painting demonstration unfold, I'm going to be explaining to you all the things that I've learned from doing this master copy. Plus, I'll introduce to you and give you a little history on the artist Elizabeth Louise Vigie Lebrun, in case you don't already know her. So one of the things that I learned with this master copy is on my palette, you'll notice I had no earth tone colors. So my palette stayed wet a lot longer, even with putting it in the freezer and bringing it out the next day. I've been using the same palette now for three days, although most of the painting did take place in the first day. You'll see that I'm using a proportion tool every so often to check the placement of my features against my grid. Once the grid becomes more covered with paint, then I'll be using my proportion tool to check the position of the features against one another. I'm able to do this very easily because I have sized my reference image to a 12 by 12, just exactly the same size as my canvas that I'm working on. This allows me to use one-to-one -one measuring. Vigie Lebrun was a French portrait painter, especially of women and in particular Marie Antoinette. She was very popular in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Elizabeth was born in Paris on April 16, 1755. Elizabeth entered a convent at the age of five where she was living until about the age of 12. She went home just long enough for her artist father to give her some of her very first art lessons. Her father was a pretty good portrait and pastelist artist as well. Elizabeth continued practicing painting portraits and she got so good that by the time she reached her early teens, she was painting portraits professionally. The young Marie's studio was seized because she was practicing painting portraits without a license. She then entered the Academy de Saint Luc, where she was able to gain an education and eventually <laughs> receive a license so that she could paint portraits professionally. She became a member of the Academy in 1774. Here's another thing that I learned from painting this master copy is, especially with this particular master copy, you need to use a lot of yellow ochre in skin tones. Also, the yellow ochre works really well when you're painting blondes. Another thing I learned with this master copy is I really love using the color vermilion, which is the red you see on my palette. It's not too strong, it's somewhat transparent, and it works great for the cheek and lip colors. And I really love the way that uh, Vigie Lebrun put so much of this red color through the eyebrows and around the eyes and around the nose. As I'm working through the portrait and I'm putting in this vermilion, it, I really felt like by the time I got most of the face done, I didn't have enough vermilion, but when the features are small like this and you're putting it in, it looks like it's gonna be strong enough but in the end, I had to go back and add more, and I think even had to go back again a third time and add even more 
red tones to the red areas of the face. I couldn't find out if Vigi Lebron used a toned canvas to paint her portraits on, but I imagine that she did. It was kind of the ongoing uh, traditional practice to do so. Usually it was a mid-toned gray underpainting that the portrait was put on top of. But since I'm going directly on the white canvas, I feel like that was probably a little more difficult with me trying to match the saturation and the value against uh, the portrait in the reference image. So if I were to paint this master copy again, I would do it on top of a mid value gray ground. After Elizabeth was married, her and her husband toured Flanders and the Netherlands, and there she was exposed to the Flemish masters, which inspired her to try new techniques. In 1787, Elizabeth caused a minor public scandal with her self-portrait with her daughter Julie, which was exhibited at the Salon of 1787, and it was showing her smiling with a bit of an open mouth where you could see some of the teeth. Well, this in traditional painting was not something that the critics were going to take lightly. They did not want to see a smile in a portrait painting that showed teeth. And did you see in the image of the painting? I mean, it was such a small amount of opening. I mean, you can barely see any teeth. I mean, my goodness, that's a bit harsh, I believe. So, you know, they say there's no such thing as bad publicity. Another thing that I learned while painting this master copy is that I need to work with darker value lights. So the light areas that I'm painting ended up being a tad bit too light, maybe one value too light, which you wouldn't think would be too much of an extreme difference, but it is a master copy and I'm trying to match the value and match the color <laughs> of the reference. So with that being said, uh, I felt like I should have worked with darker light tones. So when you're looking at your reference, especially on a computer monitor, that may be part of the problem. If I was looking at this painting hanging in a museum, perhaps I wouldn't have perceived her pale skin to be so much more light and value than what I was actually seeing. So <laughs> with that thought in mind, pale skin is darker in value than what you think, especially if you're viewing it on a computer monitor. So again, that brings me back to having started with a mid value gray under color, you know, a toned canvas, not the white canvas, then the pale skin that I was painting may have instantly been showing up as too light with that darker background. Okay, you'll see at the end that I check my painting in Photoshop right beside the reference image and I turn it into a black and white image. Therefore, it lets me really see the values. Are they close and where do I need to go up or down? So I wish that I had been doing that earlier in the painting process. Like at this point right here, I should have snapped a picture with my iPhone, changed it to black and white, and really studied it next to a black and white image of the reference photo. Another thing I learned is that if you take a cool green, like the Viridian that's on the palette, and I make a light value version of it, that works really well in the transition areas that are moving towards the shadow. So you're bridging a light area with a mid value or half tone area moving towards a shadow area. So those half tones work really well with that more uh, lighter value of that pale green. I also desaturated the pale green quite a lot with the ivory black and I may even put just a tiny touch of the ultramarine blue in there. There was a few things that intrigued me about this um, painting by Vigie Lebrun, and I was interested in seeing if I could capture the 
pink cheek color and that reddish color in the nose. And the other thing I really loved was the large kind of bulging eyes in this portrait. I really wanted a chance to paint those as well. I feel like the position of the head, the perspective from the viewer being down below is a little bit more modern or a little more unusual for her time period. I don't think a lot of people were commissioning portraits and having this vantage point be looking up kind of underneath the chin, underneath the nose in this type of way. So in Vigie Lebrun's masterpiece, I don't see a lot of brush strokes, especially in the skin. It looks, it doesn't look overly blended, but you can definitely tell that she's put lots of brush strokes very close together and some probably right on top of the others. So I'm being uh, careful when I put down brush strokes to make sure that I have the tiniest transitions, especially like in this nose crease, I'm using probably three to four tiny rows of transitions just to step around that nostril and into the little crease there. I'm not blending colors together. I'm stepping with the use of four different colors and then making sure that the brush strokes overlap just slightly. And in this way of overlapping the brush strokes slightly and not blending, I'm going to get the appearance of a very fine, well blended looking skin without blending. I feel like blending's going to dirty up and kill the beautiful clean color that I see in uh, Vigie Lebrun's painting. So the right eye in this master copy was giving me such a difficult time. I kept wanting to paint it smaller than what it really was in the uh, painting, especially when I'm comparing it with the one-to-one -one, uh, measuring using the proportion tool. I was actually measuring it against the grid, but then I started also to measure it against the other eye directly. And I had to keep elongating it over to the right. I just seemed to shorten it too much and I, it was such a large, strange eye to have to paint. And that's one of the things that I learned. You really can't trust your eye sometimes. It just appears that something is correct. Then you step back and you realize, no, it's not correct. And you're, when I was measuring it with the proportion tool, I was like, oh my gosh, how can that be right? Can that possibly be that big of an eye? And it was. So if you're measuring, it's good to kind of Put it in based on the measurements, step back, take a look at it. Does it visually look correct? If not, then go back and figure out where you went wrong and fix it before you move on from there. Because the other features that come along, like the mouth, the side of the head, are going to play off of the position of this right eye. And if it's not correct, then those other features and areas of the face are also going to look off. So another thing I learned is you can't expect to paint a master copy in six hours and have it look really close to the masterpiece work that you're actually copying. So typically my selective start portraits are done very loose and very painterly and I like the way that they look when I am not copying a master work. So having that kind of in my mind that I should be able to finish this portrait within six to eight hours uh, needed to get out of my head because it is not possible to create a masterwork and have it even come close to the um, original masterpiece that you're copying in that short amount of time. I can only imagine that this painting was done in several um, sessions indirectly. So letting the layer dry and then painting another layer on top of that, letting it dry and painting probably another layer or glazing on top of that. In fact, it looks to me when I look closely at the Vigie Lebrun portrait that there is some glazing 
possibly of that vermilion color over certain areas and certain features. So keeping a realistic uh, point of view on the results of my copy, I had to understand that I was working wet into wet, even though it was over the period of a couple days, it was still wet into wet. I was never giving the painting time to dry and then working on top of a dry layer. So the results, there's just no way that I could actually copy it to such a high degree of, of you know, where you really felt like it was so, so close doing this wet into wet. Elizabeth Vigie Lebron's career really took off once she started painting the portraits of Marie Antoinette. So Marie Antoinette was getting portraits done by other artists and she was simply not happy with the results. It was thought that she went through several different artists before coming across Vigie Lebron. She had her portrait done and she was very happy with the results. And it was thought that Marie uh, Antoinette really became fond of Vigie Lebrun and they forged a close friendship. Vigie Lebrun painted over 30 paintings of the queen and her children and they had a great friendship until the time when Marie Antoinette became very unpopular with her people and at that point uh, Vigie Lebrun had to distance herself and leave France for fear that she was also going to be harmed. Okay, here's where things went a little bit awry. I pulled some more white into the flesh tones that I had already created, which were more than light enough as far as value goes. Now, maybe I needed to adjust some of the U to be more yellow or to be more pink, but never I don't think should I have gone lighter than what I had originally mixed. So I will carry that forward with me into painting other portraits in the future and remember that I need to keep my light values on the more dark side. Like I said earlier, just lighter values should remain a little bit darker than what you think. You can always lighten them. It's a little more difficult, I find, to darken the light areas of a portrait than it is to lighten them. Here's a tip for when you're painting any portrait. The thing that really needs to be correct are the eyebrows. The eyebrows are so important and if you have them off even slightly, then the likeness in your portrait is not going to be as close as it could be. So make sure you pay a lot of attention and take your time getting those eyebrows just right. It is so clear to me visually in viewing the painting demonstration here that I had a very yellow skin tone, which while I was painting it, it didn't appear to be quite this yellow. So <laughs> at some point, I think I'm noticing it, and I needed to go in and add more of that vermilion color to the flesh tones to kind of peach it up a little bit. So one of the things that I learned from this master copy is that it's a good idea to put in your dark background before you judge the lights and the highlights in your portrait, especially in the uh, forehead and along the upper cheek area. Those lights shouldn't be really judged for a final value until you have your darkest darks in place. So I think intuitively at this point, I'm realizing that I need to check what's happening in the skin tones against some darker values. So I'm putting in this hair and then I'm going to go in with the darker background color so that I can better judge what I'm doing. I'm definitely loving this yellow ochre pale for creating the blonde color of her hair in the portrait. I can now see with putting the hair color in place 
that the skin tones are looking a little yellow and I'm seeing that I probably need to go back in and add some more of that vermilion. Now look as this really dark background goes in, how pale that face just got. So Vigie Lebron was trying to get a painting education at a time in history when women were severely um, held back from learning in institutions and getting the same type of education that male artists were receiving. So in 1783, she was only one of 15 women to be granted full membership into the academy. And you weren't allowed to have family ties into the art business. So it just happens that her husband was an art dealer. And when the Academy found out about this, they initially were going to refuse her admittance into the Academy. So she went to her friend, Marie Antoinette, and she got King Louis the 16th to overrule that um, thought and get her into the Academy. So <laughs> Vigie Lebron just couldn't catch a break. So she got into the Academy, everything's going along great, and then the French Revolution happens. So once it was over, her <laughs> membership into the Academy was dissolved because they no longer allowed females to attend these types of academies. So boy, trying to be an artist at this time in history was no easy feat, especially if you were a woman. So after the French Revolution, in October of 1789, Vigie Lebrun had to leave France. She left with her young daughter, Julie, and her husband remained in Paris. He did not think that it was going to be um, a long period of time before Elizabeth was allowed to return to Paris. But it ended up being a long 12 years that she was not allowed to be in France. So at that time she was working and living in Italy and then later moved to Austria. She was painting portraits of high up officials uh, like royalty and different uh, members of their family and their court. Then she was in Russia, then she went to Germany, and then finally, after her husband petitioned to have her name removed from some list of people that were like against the King of France, she was able to return. So Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun lived out her later years in Paris where she was happily painting portraits until she died in Paris on March 30th of 1842 at the age of 86. So another thing that I learned from this master copy is using the combination of the yellow ochre pale mixed with a little bit of vermilion to create a kind of glowy orange. That glowy orange color worked really well transitioning from the light to the shadow area. And that transition line where they almost connect is the area in your portraits where you're going to have the highest degree of saturation and that orange color was a really good way to bridge the area between the light and the shadow. I also realized that in this master copy, neck shadows can have a lot of red in them. Now, they don't have to be a very dark value in the shadow, but it does have to be pretty hot. A lot of red and orange. I kept adding more and more red into the next shadow as I kept going and painting. Okay, the other thing I learned with this master copy is that when you think you're finished, you're not. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I finished the entire portrait and when, you know, left the studio, came back in a couple hours and realized I was not done. And I often have that experience when I am painting portraits in my studio. You think you're finished, but then you're not. So the other thing that I learned is things always look different the next day. Here's a look at my palette. You can see I've created a lot of new colors. 
Here's my first comparison. I pulled up my painting at this point in time and looked at it side by side with the reference in Photoshop. Then I turned it to a black and white value study so I could see exactly how it was coming along in that area. So with the comparison pulled up, I went back to my painting and added the reds and different things that I saw missing in the first comparison. Which now brings me to the third and final comparison. This was where I ended up. I mean, like I said, it's wet into wet. I don't know that I could ever achieve the true uh, close value and color and the things that you see here in the reference image by working in this direct manner versus an indirect master copy. So here's the results at the end. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one.